Coalition MP lets the cat out of the bail-in bag. Martin North, John Adams. In the interest of people. Hello, sir. Hello, John. Good to see you. You too. Look a bit smart tonight. What's going on? Uh, well, after we record this uh, show tonight, um, I've been invited to uh, go on Russian television. <laughs> um, now, it, it is RT International, so it will be in English, but they want to talk about chess. Um, a number of uh, Russian legends have come out against this particular issue, and they've invited me, so we're going to do it from your studio. Uh, but tonight's a conversation, which is actually quite important, isn't about chess, it's actually about bail-in, which, um, you know, we, we're getting to the crunch point because we've got one and a half weeks to go until submissions submissions are due with the Senate Economics Committee parliamentary inquiry. Yes, the, it's a bit of a short countdown, isn't it? And it's yeah. very important that we get those submissions in and make the points we really want to make. Indeed, indeed. Now, the purpose of tonight's conversation is to reveal um, a very revealing um, um, email that, that, that we saw from Tim Wilson um, about bail-in. Now, Tim Wilson, obviously, federal MP, coalition, member for Goldstein, importantly, the chairman of the House Economics Committee. So one would expect, given his chairman role, he actually has some um, knowledge and expertise on economic and banking matters. <laughs> but that is an assumption. Big assumption, yeah. Cool. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. So um, after we recorded, I think, one of our previous shows last week about bail-in, um, I put out a newsletter um, that I send out via my website, um, it, you know, bringing to focus to, to my subscribers the importance of the inquiry. Now, uh, one of my subscribers who watches this show sent my newsletter to Tim Wilson, and Tim Wilson responded um, about bail-in. Um, and so we're going to actually talk about what Tim had to say um, because uh, because it, it is it is you know he's let the cat out of the bag to to, to 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 some degree, but before we go into what Tim actually said, just to preface this conversation, I think we just need to talk about risk because um, to understand this issue of bail-in and why this legislation is so important, we need to have we need to actually understand well th this this law is addressing a form of risk, and we need to be clear about what form of risk it is actually addressing. So if we can put up um, slide one, Martin, on the screen. So here in this um, slide, I've outlined three forms of risk, market risk, institutional risk, and legal risk. And basically market risk is the risk of um, extreme economic conditions or market conditions eventuating in a financial crisis that, that threatens one or multiple banks in their solvency. So, so, so basically, if the economy, if the mar if we had a financial uh, system meltdown, that sort of risk is what we talk about market risk. Institutional risk is we're talking about the risk of an individual bank um, and, and how uh, risky or safe they are in terms of their solvency position. And then we're talking about legal risk, the risk of the law allowing bail-in to occur. So, um, and, and the reason why to make these distinctions is is that. Um, what we're trying to address, so, so just to take a step back, Martin, in 2018, um, when this issue of bail-in um, was, was, was you know, heavily debated when the law passed in Parliament, there was um, a proposition put forward by the CEC and other parties to say that the law would legally allow bail-in to occur. Um, now, on that particular point, the government... APRA and the Treasury and others said no retail bank deposits are safe from bail-in and there is no legal risk. Now our position is that through the loophole we, we, you and I identified in 2018 we dispute that assurance from the government that there is no legal risk but it's important that um, we make no comment about market risk or institutional risk. So we're not saying that, you know, um, uh, that bail-in is going to happen tomorrow mm. or that a particular bank is about to fall over or anything like that. Um, th this debate's not about the probability of bail-in occurring. This debate is about does the law allow bail-in of retail bank deposits or not? And, and obviously, because this is a because we're addressing legal risk, um, um, obviously this whole inquiry comes down to a very legal 
a technical legal point that 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 um, is important for our viewers to understand, but also more importantly, the press and the parliamentarians who actually have to examine this issue in detail. Yeah, and my guess is, I think that they probably were assured back in 2018 that there wasn't going to be an issue, right? But I suspect some also were aware that there was a bit of wriggle room. And what we've done is basically shone a spotlight on the legal black hole that is at the heart of the bill. Indeed, indeed. And, and, and just, just for if we have any new viewers, so uh, we identified a, a legal loophole that um, when I consulted members of parliament and their advisors, they did not examine. Yep. So, so when they passed, when they, when they got these assurances and certain um, senators voted for the legislation, um, they, they didn't look at the stuff we looked at. Um, and obviously, when I'm an economist, you're a banking expert, neither one of us are lawyers. But after we did our shows in 2018, we had a Sydney solicitor, uh, Robert Butler, he wrote a legal opinion saying that our loophole was legitimate. Um, and obviously, the legislation that Senator Roberts has put forward to Parliament is to actually address uh, the legal risk that we've identified. So, so basically, it's a very simple piece of legislation, um, and it makes crystal clear that, um, that, that under no circumstances can the government order a conversion or write-off, a bail-in, um, in the conversion of deposits into shares, just like what happened with the Bank of Cyprus during a financial crisis. Yeah. Okay. Well, so with that context then, John, what did Tim actually say? He had a few things to say. We're going to bring it up over two slides. So this is from uh, Tim Wilson, an email sent to one of our viewers on the 23rd of June. Um, this is the quote. quote, At this stage, I do not believe that there is justification for Senator Roberts' bill. Bank deposits are already capital holdings of the bank. That is how banks work. The issue is whether you can withdraw the deposits. At this stage, I am not convinced there is any risk, as if the bank requires to turn to deposits for T1 Capital in exchange for equity, the likelihood is the bank will be on the verge of collapse, and the alternative is not equity but nothing. Now, Tim, Tim goes on to say, um, quote, if people don't want to be exposed to this risk, then they have other options, such as buying precious minerals or holding non-deposited cash. Whether you make this decision is a matter for yourself. So, John, that's quite interesting, but he seems to be talking about the situation when a bank is failing, right? Um, so is that the same as what we're talking about in terms of when the regulator intervenes? Um, Martin, what, what, so, so when I read Tim's email, um, when, when, when he says that, that, that uh, you know, at this stage I'm not convinced there is any risk, um, the type of risk he's talking about in, in, the, in, the, in that first slide that we showed was the risk of, um, you know, uh, the risk of a Australian bank failing um, and that that bank um, is, is requiring a bail-in. Now, w when he says that, that if this ever were to happen, you would get nothing, um, well, well, that, 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 that's actually quite, quite false because, mm. um, I mean, there has never been a full wipeout of uninsured deposits um, I mean, whether it's in 1892 or in the case of the Bank of Cyprus, um, if your deposits got converted into shares, you did get something. Mm. So there will be something left. Um, but the important thing is, is that um, the, 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 in, in the second part of, of the email, when, when Tim says, if people don't want to be exposed to this risk, uh, they have other options. That is the cat out of the bag because the government's official position is, is that there is no legal risk to bail-in happening. But he is now saying if you don't, be the, if you don't want to be exposed to this risk of, uh, of, of uh, being, you know, potentially having your deposit converted to shares, take your money out of the bank, hold precious metals or hold physical cash. Now, that is not the government's position um, formally, whether by Treasury APRA or, or, or the minister. And yet now we have the chairman of the House Economic Committee saying, you know, that there is a legal risk. And so uh, now the big question is, does Tim Wilson actually understand the law um, or was he just shooting off, um, you know, like was he just shooting this email from the top of his head, which some parliamentarians tend to do. Um, 
the reason why this I think is important, Martin, is, is that um, I don't think the law is properly understood by most members of parliament. Mm. And, and what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, uh, so there are people who, who want, who don't want bail-in to occur for retail deposits. And I think for us, we're, you know, putting the policy issue to one side, we just want the law in public policy to be consistent and to be crystal clear. And, and, this, and, and this law says, that uh, it basically says to the government, if your position is that deposits under no circumstances can be ordered to be bailed in by the regulator, the prudential regulator APRA, this law makes it crystal clear that it can never happen. Um, and so uh, my view is, is that there is no downside risk to parliament passing this law. Mm. Um, but if for whatever reason they say no, that's going to raise a lot more suspicions because it's going to add further confusion about the intent of policy, but also the state of the law. Yeah, well, you know, Tim's response basically screams risk, right? It also screams ambiguity, right? And what we're trying to do is to make sure that the legal ambiguity is absolutely cut off at the knees. Indeed, yep. indeed. Now, um, I'm still putting my submission together uh, and I think it's fair to say you're putting your yep. submission together. Now, um, I have had some discussions, preliminary discussions with members of the media, uh, the mainstream media. There are a few outlets that are interested to cover the inquiry. Um, uh, last week when I had a conversation with one journalist, it was clear to me that the knowledge among some journalists about this issue is quite low to mm. non-existent. Yep. So uh, what I've done is created a summary document, uh, and that's already completed. And the summary document is basically 11 questions with 11 simple answers to explain w what is bail-in, why is this important, what's the context um, of, of what's happened post-GFC, what happened in the 19th century, um, what is what, what happened in 2018 when the um, crisis resolution powers bill was passed um, what was the government's assurances what's the legal loophole um, why is this law um, uh, required and obviously um, you know international bail-in regimes and, and obviously talking about New Zealand being the most transparent um, in the world um, so, so 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 now I've already started to um, circulate this document. So I put the document together, you looked at it, and a few other people looked at it, everyone was happy with it. Um, and, and we all feel that it's a reflection of, of where this whole situation is going. Mm. So I've, start, I've, I've circulated it to, to some members of the press, some members of parliament. Uh, I have had a, a conversation with uh, one of the uh, committee member staff um, just to um, bring them up to speed with this. Um, and, and we'll be doing that more in the next few days. Um, if people would like a copy of my summary, and my summary is not my submissions. So the submission's going to be much more detailed, much more technical. But if anyone would like my summary, um, feel free to we'll put my email on the screen. People can email me. I can happy to share my summary with people now that I'm circulating it with pe people in Parliament and people um, and, and members of the press. Um, and then obviously with this, hopefully the summary will give people some context as to how they formulate their own submissions. But also, um, uh, if people want to forward my summary on to uh, their contacts um, so that more people are aware of this issue, the inquiry, the, le the legislation, feel free. I, I, th I think it's an important uh, you know, thing that people should be doing. Yeah, I think that's right, John. I, you know, kudos to you for carrying on and getting those Q&A sorted out. My other observations, because I've had a couple of chats with people in the media, and a couple of them are saying, well, we'll cover it once the submissions have closed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they don't want to influence the submission process, interestingly. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, y yeah, well, so, so, so it's surprising in, in that sense because on, on the cash ban, um, there was a lot of press during, uh, mm. well, even before the inquiry started, Correct. but then during the inquiry. During. So, yeah. so, so, so that obviously, you know, the, particularly the reporting by the ABC, it actually lifted the profile and actually got people's attention to actually put in submissions. Mm. So, uh, so, so, yeah, so there, there have been people who have sort of suggested that as well. And obviously, you know, the submission process closes Friday next week. Yep. So, um, but um, I am having some uh, off the record discussions with some journalists at the moment just to um, get them aware of why this is important. Yep. And uh, you're also asking for a hearing. Indeed. Um, so last week, so, so what we know at this stage is submissions are due on the 10th of July mm. and then the uh, inquiry is supposed to report back to the full Senate on the 10th of August. Uh, 
there has been no commitment around a public hearing. Um, I last week uh, contacted the chair's, uh, the chairman's um, office, um, Senator Brockman, and I also contacted the deputy chair, and I asked them both for a one-day public hearing. So my big concern, Martin, is is that because this is a very technical argument, um, uh, what I just want to make sure is that the senators are fully aware of the point we're trying to make and why this legislation is important. Now, you can read a whole bunch of submissions, mm. um, and, and, and maybe the understanding is there, maybe it's not. Um, so uh, uh, I know there are people who have watched a lot of our shows on Balin, and still when it comes to some of these technical matters, you know, there are still some misunderstandings. And so what I've asked the chair and deputy chair is, let's have a day of hearings. You know, I'd like to testify. I think you'd like to testify. Maybe we, we, we could get Robert Butler to testify, and and, and obviously let's let, let's actually put, you know, a technical explanation in front of the senators. Let them ask questions, just so that we're all crystal clear about what this is. Because, um, uh, you know, it will be a shame if the committee report, uh, well, if the inquiry produces a report and the report is full of, uh, you know, technical inaccuracies. Mm. Well, the risk is that, of course, it will just take, go around in circles and not take us anywhere. So it's very important we try and get the direction and outcome we want, but also to have clarity on the outcome. Indeed. Mm. So, so what I would ask um, our audience, if they would like to assist us, is um, obviously important to uh, try to understand this issue, put in a submission. If people want guidance, I think some people have asked me for guidance. Some people have asked you for guidance. Yep. Uh, I mean, uh, while I work on my full submission, this summary document, I think, will, will help people uh, try to understand the issue. Um, but I would also ask people to email the chair, um, Senator Brockman, email the deputy chair, Senator Gallagher. We'll put their emails up on the screen and, 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 and encourage them to have a day of hearing so we can actually get the right experts to testify just so that you know we, we can we can make our case because um, I dare say that if we can't make our case on this occasion um, it will be a long long time away before we can actually try to right the wrongs of 2018. Yep it's a one opportunity so we have to put our best step forward and uh, I think um, keep up the good work John all power to your elbow. Thank you very much. Great. Martin North, John Adams, interested people, we'll see you next time.